Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 373 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. Welcome back to the show. Great. Amazing. Thank you for joining me. If it's your first time watching this show via YouTube, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review, download the show and share it with your friends. And to support the show and get access to over 300 episodes, as well as this episode in full HD before it goes out anywhere else in audio format, please make sure you support the podcast via Patreon. The link can be found in the comments down below or in the show notes description. It's patreon.com for just Agostino. That's patreon.com for just A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Click there for a little, little as one dollar per month you get access to my entire library as well as this audio podcast in full audio format before it goes on any other platform so get subscribed on the old patreon god damn it how you doing how you feeling great amazing how am i yeah trucking on trucking on in trucking on up trucking on out um a little bit annoyed i think <laughs> at the last couple of days mostly due to my beloved manchester united completely capitulating in the transfer market we seem to have absolutely no idea um about how we want to move forward as a club actually i think we do let me let me revise that i think internally the club have basically proved without any shadow of a doubt, they did, they're not interested about being a good football club or about winning trophies or about creating memorable nights in Europe, right? Or about having some of the best players play for our badge. They're more concerned about ensuring that we have the revenue that allows the owners to siphon off cash from our club without investing anything back into the club itself. That's what the Glazers and the Ed Woodward regime has basically subjected us to. But I think, unfortunately, some fans have only come to that realization recently, I guess. They've kind of finally woken up to the fact that maybe the Glazers aren't really interested in making us great again. They're interested in making sure we make money and we cover their nut and we allow for for them to go on their, you know, on their lavish holidays, you know, over the summers or, you know, during the year, I guess, in all ways, shape and tense purposes. But for us fans on the outside, it's just hard to deal with, man. To see some, to see clubs that finish under, you know, behind us, well, yeah, to see clubs that finished outside top four, investing way more into their squad than we are, to see the champions looking at adding a world class midfielder in Thiago into their team in order to give them the extra push to maybe allow them to do the double. You know, um, again, this season, you know, the potential of Liverpool winning the Champions League and the Premier League is really high, especially if they are able to bring in someone like a Thiago who completely changes everything about that team. He allows them to do so much going forward. He allows Klopp to rotate um, without a significant drop in quality, especially in that heart of the midfield position. And it just really opens up their attack in, in a whole different dimension. I'm sure most of you have seen um, the Liverpool v Leeds game. No one can deny that. Mo Salah looks a lot hungrier, a lot trim. Maybe it's the haircut, but he looks in, you know, he looks like he worked out the entire time that he was in lockdown. He hasn't missed a step. He's come back raring and hungry to go. So imagine, you know, Thiago sitting behind a front three of Firmino, Mane and Salah, right? Spraying balls, uh, popping balls over the top and just generally being a creative force that he is. Whilst Man United have effectively only signed one player so far and recalled, what was it, um, Dean Henderson and given him a bumper contract. So there's problems everywhere, really. None of it makes sense. Looking at it now, you're thinking to yourself, why would you why would you get Dean Henderson back without letting Romero go? Doesn't make any sense. Why would you then get Dean Henderson back and then give him a new contract that effectively makes him what? It basically forces the manager to play him, right? If you give a if you give your second string keeper a hundred and twenty thousand plus or whatever the you know, the purported fee is, it's very difficult to keep him on the bench, I would imagine. It's very difficult to say like, hey, you don't play the majority of the season. He has to play, what, most of the cup games. He has to play most of maybe the group stages of European competitions. Maybe, I don't know. So that causes unnecessary pressure. Then you've got the defence. You've got Maguire, who didn't pull up any trees last season. You need a new centre-back that you're clearly shopping for. I'm not sure what that's done to the confidence of the players playing behind there or playing in that position. You've got players that are injury-prone but good in terms of Eric Bailly. You can't be relied upon. Same with Luke Shaw. You've got unproven quality in Brandon Williams, who was given a new contract, which I don't understand either. You could have easily kind of waited and not given him anything um, just, for the sake, just for the sake that he's a young player and he still has a lot to prove. Um, I think the fact that he came in, hit the ground running at the beginning, 
of the season and then kind of tailed off is evident you know it's basically proof of what most young players go through they sort of kind of peter out towards the end of the season and the fact that he wasn't able to rest the fact that he was basically played throughout the season because most of the players the the person that should have been playing in Luke Shaw was consistently injured or sometimes not on form so you have all these poles in our team that need to be addressed and the one sign we have made in Van der Beek wasn't necessarily the one position that we were crying out for don't get me wrong we still need the option I, I feel a lot better I feel a lot more um calm when we have to sub off a Bruno or a Pogba to bring Van der Beek on then have to bring on Pereira or have to bring on a wine matter especially in the current system we're playing and yeah I still look at Rashford and think you know has he actually recovered from his supposed broken back injury um has he was he carrying another knock did he still have that niggling ankle or knee injury he had that he was still struggling with um are we hoping that Martial goes the entire season without a major injury which is unlikely considering his injury record too Daniel James is suffering confidence and not what he was prior to um the lockdown just so many questions but again all of this could be relieved um there could be a lot of, of good feeling going into a new season especially going into this weekend's fixture with the additions of some quality signings right we've meant to be in for regular but it looks like tottenham have probably um stolen the march on us there by simply offering the money that Real Madrid want and agreeing to their terms i don't agree they need to just spin they're putting out there they're putting out so much spin about oh we didn't want to sign him because of the buyback clause da, 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 da. don't believe the spin Man United are really Man United under kind of the current regime are really good at never addressing things publicly or directly with the fans they always kind of go through second third parties and you know the recent interview that um Ed Woodward done or somebody from the club done with um someone i forgot who it was with and they didn't release the entire interview in audio format they just released um some 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 transcripts right um from the interview like you know carefully chosen quotes they're very careful about who they speak to and how they speak in public but when it comes to putting out information to alleviate the fears or to you know twist the narrative to their favor they're very quick with it especially with the hiring of this new PR guy that the Glazers or is it Edward specifically hired I think my main my main night that kind of that Wally from the Sunday papers on Sky Sports that you know it's got that voice it talks like an intellect but he's a bit of a div that dude right He's obviously spinning it and, you know, using his press contacts to feed certain stories, put certain stories out there. And now we're in a position where they're making us believe as if the only reason why we didn't sign Regulon is because of the buyback clause. That was a major thing. And again, if you're a big club, if you're United and you actually want to um, steal a march, you actually want to get closer to your opponents, get closer to your title rivals, right? Because we're talking about United, we're not talking about no Champions League um, qualifying nonsense. If you actually want to close the gap on the title winners, you just sign Regulon and you deal with the buyback clause later when it when it, when, when it raises a good head again. Or like a big club, you buy him in the hope that even if it's 30 million for one season or for two seasons, it's going to pay dividends because he might effectively be the difference in terms of finishing second and third. He might be a difference between, you know, um, qualifying for, you know, um, what you call it, getting out of the group stages, maybe getting to the last stage of, of the European Cups. He might even be the difference between actually winning it, right? Like, so a 30 million in investments plus his wages for two seasons and you get the opportunity to finish consecutively in Champions League for two seasons in a row and you get a good couple of cup runs you might win a couple of trophies here and there I think it's more than worth it and then like a big club you'd also then make the adjustments or you make the necessary precautions to, to have like a list of backup people in case he does get recalled in case he does get a bit homesick and wants to go back to Madrid that's what you'd do you wouldn't just throw your hands up and say oh they want to buy back close so we're not going to get him that's a cop-out it's a cop-out because they don't want to address the situation they don't want to address the issues they don't want to um they don't want to make the investment necessary because if they do they're going to be then judged in a whole different way maybe that's a thing it's a bit odd to be honest because you'd imagine the one manager that they could get away with actually backing and having no kickback and having no kind of pushback from the fans would be Oli. every other manager felt like they could have had you know fans could be within their rights to basically voice their concerns about why this manager is getting the purse strings right whether it was Louis van Gaal, David Moyes or Jose Mourinho there will be fans out there that will be like you know what I don't trust this guy with the money but Ole Gunnar Solskjaer so far whether or not it's through pure luck or 
because he's a good at actually identifying players. He's actually been, he's actually, his record in transfer market has been pretty good for the most part. He's obviously has this new cultural reset paradigm that he's kind of adopting, which, you know, I think again, is a lot of fluff, but if it's to believe on surface level and he actually is prioritizing the character and the makeup of the player, as opposed to just their technical skills and their branding capabilities and marketing potential. And he's actually favoring the person over the, you know, the, the media conglomerate then that is amazing right but if that's the case and he's actually been able to prove that his approach is maybe working why not trust him with the money and then if he fails he's got no one else to blame but himself right that would be the great tactic from the from the glazers but they don't do that instead we just got the same routine that happened under Louis van Gaal, same routine that happened under Jose Mourinho, where we qualify for Europe and then suddenly the money dries up. Suddenly we're not signing more players. Suddenly the holes in our team get completely, get kind of laid to bear. And it's, again, it's an unfortunate position to be in because I think if you're an owner of a club, it's one of those things where you start to realise that the more success that you actually get on the pitch, the more you have to invest in the actual team, right? But then I guess the hope is, if you're if you're one of the successful clubs, is that the, consist- the consistency of you performing on the biggest stage is going to allow you to kind of open up your earning potential, whether it's from brands or sponsors or just generally from just, uh, you know, attendance money and prize money for just, you know, um, getting to various stages in the competition. That's what the hope is. But the unfortunate reality is that the more successful you are, you you are the more money you have to pile in the only way you don't have to pile in money is if you just become like a mid-tier sort of premier league club that's stable with you know a pretty good infrastructure like a look like a good example would be like a burnley right or even like a leicester now they've probably kind of crept into that sort of zone at the moment they're probably never going to turn in for a title again but they're daring about you know to finish top six um burnley probably daring about to finish top 10 that's the only place where you probably won't need to invest that much money. But even Leicester, they've signed like two or three players. Burnley are probably going to be signing a couple more players. You just can't sit still, especially in the Premier League. It just doesn't work in football, in life in general. So to see these guys essentially run our club into the ground has been distressing. Again, it's something that I try not to think too much about because, again, what can I do? How can I affect change in no way, shape or form? I cannot. It would be nice to see our fan base be a little bit more united around you know, no pun intended around what the issue is. Um, Because I think there are some fans out there still who are kind of have this delusion that as long as we sign Sancho, we'll be okay. And I'm here to tell you, that's not, that's not true. We still need a defensive midfielder. We still need a competent right winger or, you know, maybe even an option on the left, depending whatever you look at. We need a left, I can even send her back, right? Those are still some glaring holes in our team that need to be addressed. We can't go into another season with our backup centre-backs being Bailly, Phil Jones, Marcus Rojo and co, right? That just shouldn't be the case. We need to have better options. Now, of course, someone will say, hey, Solskjaer spent 80 million on Harry Maguire and didn't work out. Cool, but you're going to have to stick with him. You know, he's England's captain. Um, He can do no wrong. You're going to have to stick with him anyway. That's one position out of the way. Lindelof and Bailly are going to have to scrap for the second spot, but they haven't been convincing whenever they've had a run in the team. So you have an open slot there for somebody to take. And yeah, you can't tell me just signing Jadon Sancho is going to be enough because it isn't. Because there's still the possibility that if he gets injured and alongside with along with any other striker up front, our team completely changes the makeup of how we attack, of how we approach teams. It completely changes and again i'm not even sold on this counter-attacking football that we supposedly are playing now that that's not really working for me in that regard because you know the united i remember best are the ones that kept the ball you know that possession based united that were stretching teams pulling them apart you know switching the play left and right um and just bringing you know using different weapons to defeat opponents in different sort of ways this approach where we just you know we sit back and hit hit teams on the counter all the time is really odd especially considering we don't do it as nearly as efficiently or proficiently as we did in the past so loads of issues there to really um decipher i'll be interested to see how Oli Gunnar Solskjaer approaches the interview on the weekend will he use as an opportunity to like speak openly about what's going on or will he just do what he usually does and just kind of you know be a company man and just you know kind of nod along and agree what's going on and then maybe privately you know start throwing some phones around the office but i would like to see him publicly come out and say something a little bit more forceful than what he said previously again you don't have to throw your employer under the bus but he needs to be clear in that 
we need some improvements if you want to build upon last season, right? Not not that we're not going to have a good season this season. I don't think so. I don't think we're going to finish as low as six, as some people are saying. I still think it'll be it's not going to be that easy for us to finish in the top four if we don't improve our squad. But he needs to come out and say, hey, we need to, if we want to build on what we have last year from last season, we need to add to our squad and team. It's, an, it's just a, it's not even up for debate. It just has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, we are F-U-C-K-E-D'd. That's why I think anyway. But again, what do I know? So, lots of topics to talk about. Lots of things to get into, actually. It's, I always bum me out talking about my night, man. That's why I try not to even keep up to date with all this stuff. It's just annoying, and it really, really bloody is all annoying. Lots of stuff to get into. Those are interesting topics I want to delve on in. Number one, because I love all this stuff concerning some of the mass debates, because some of the individuals that, you know, tend to uh, frequent some of these events are just special, special human beings. So this is a report from Utah about an anti-mask, I guess, gathering of people who were essentially um, uh, were arguing the fact that this, uh, it's their constitutional right to refuse to wear the mask or some nonsense but it's just it's just hilarious to see the characters that are involved in this sort of stuff so let's play a little bit of the video for you now boom 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 Gathered on the steps of the Utah State Capitol tonight, protesting Governor Gary Herbert's mass mandate in schools. It was the first major gathering since eight Utahns filed a lawsuit against the governor, accusing him of overstepping his ex executive powers. Fox 13. Imagine that, right? You're having an anti mask protest because of a mask mandate that's put in place for schools. And then eight of those, was it five to eight parents or whatever? Are suing the governor just imagine how nutty again sometimes i i i like to laugh at it but i'm also thankful that i don't live there because as bad as it's going here in the uk you know the incompetence levels here have been you know at an all-time high um local lockdowns are probably going to come into effect in the next couple of weeks especially if this spike continues going where it's going but jesus christ man the delusion that exists over the states is just absolutely maddening and again, I don't really think it's even a big issue to be like, oh, hey, you have a difference of opinion in terms of approach. That's fair enough, isn't it, right? Because there, there are some legitimate arguments about, hey, does, lock, does a lockdown even work, right? Um, is it um, economically viable? Um, does it do more damage than good? Blah, blah, blah. There's some actually, there's some good debates to have around um, how you deal with issues such as coronavirus, and especially if we have something else that springs up later on in our lifetime. It's probably, so there probably are some good lessons to be learned from this, but to stand there and just argue the fact that, you know, just argue a way that you just don't think masks work in the first place and that you don't think they have any place in society and it's your constitutional right to just go maskless around the world and live your life free and do whatever you want to do especially in light of what's going on around the world it's just so 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 social side it really really is but maybe it isn't maybe again maybe it's just like a difference in perspective people just look at the world in a different way they fundamentally just never would accept the word or the mandate of the state they just won't it's just it's just in their bones it's just ingraining them to question literally everything and this is the result you get <clears throat> teens adam herbetz is live at the capitol tonight to show us how this all went hey adam yeah, John Kirsten, organizers say this issue has picked up a lot of steam over the past few months, but they still believe some protesters got a late start. Because remember, at first, Governor Gary Herbert was very reluctant to issue any sort of mask mandate. Down, down with the traitor. Tasha Nelson what? is singing the unofficial fifth verse. You got that singing, okay? Of the Star Spangled Banner at a rally where people say they believe more in the Constitution than they believe in wearing a mask. Jesus it's not Christ. about masks versus non-masks. It's about freedom to choose. Some say they... Okay, again, my head is hurting. So if it's about freedom to choose, but then everyone else chooses to... Yeah, this is the thing that's odd. The same people that are saying it's about freedom to choose are also the same people that argue or have fallings out or have the public freakouts with shop owners when they refuse them entry into their business right because if it's if, if it's offering to choose and the business owner of a store a gas station has decided that he only allow people in his in his or her establishment if they wear some kind of face covering and you try to enter their establishment which again is private property and refuse entry you have no right to kick up a fuss and to you know live stream the whole event to all your middle-aged facebook friends right you shouldn't be doing that because 
they have they've decided right so you, you everyone has a choice they've decided that hey masks are important you decided they're not important so why are you infringing on their right to wear one and refuse you entry if you don't wear one that doesn't make any sense in it it's such a weird logic and i like how the and it's again i appreciate the fact that they try to explain themselves and try to make it seem logical and fair and some there's some sort of rational involved in, um uh there's some sort of rational thinking involved in it but really if you get to the heart of it there isn't really in it it's just they are maddened by the fact that the world has stopped they're maddened at the fact that they have to suddenly change the way that they go about existing and maneuvering around the world and they just can't get over the fact that things have changed and it's just what it is for the, again it's just temporary this isn't I'm, I'm sure some of them have these weird conspiracy theories where they feel like oh if we let the state come in now and tell us to wear masks then where where how far is it going to go but for the most part no one is saying this is going to last forever right this is just like a temporary measure in place to ensure that we all live to see another day that is essentially what it is now is the messaging being wrong are people just intrinsically uh, is there just a population of, is there just a segment of the population that are just going to be intrinsically against any kind of state mandate i don't know but whatever it is this, this isn't the answer protesting and singing fifth verses of so, uh, yeah yeah I do not believe in any of the mask science some say they just don't think it works for kids and others say they do trust the cdc they just don't like being told what to do children should not that's interesting isn't it it's that's a big group of people right people that don't think the science is real people that think children shouldn't be wearing it people that don't trust the cdc and people that just think you know it doesn't it's just a it's a well, it's a hoax and they've all managed to kind of hang in it's actually weird that they're actually more united around the idea of not wearing a mask or questioning it or being anti-mask than the black lives matter people isn't that funny right there's it seems like again from the outside looking in that the black lives matter movement is a very fringe uh it's a very fringe end of the kind of work politics you see on twitter right that it's not everybody that is for the betterment of uh, black people in North America, I'd imagine, are back in Black Lives Matter, right? Some people would obviously see it as a front, um, as a uh, a front to what? A front to affirmative action, um, a front to what was that racial issue thing that we saw recently online, where they have these um, racial diversity quotes, you know, programs, whatever it may be, right? Some people have some fundamental reasons why they're not Black Lives Matter, right? But they obviously are for the betterment of black people in North America. They're obviously against police brutality, all these sort of like hot button topics. They usually fall on the quote unquote right side. But it, it then gets into some murky waters once they get into some other action pieces, right? About how to how to best move forward. What is the best way to do it? Is it about enforcing these anti racism classes and, you know, um, outlooks in corporate companies like starbucks or is it about getting on the ground and informing local community members about how they can empower themselves to make the change like there's some really st stringent ideological splits there but it seems like with the anti-mask group like even though they all occupied varying levels varying scales of the argument right they're in the whole different what they're in whole different positions they still have managed to kind of gather around then you know for a common cause and sort of fight this mask thing which is pretty commendable they're all batshit crazy don't get me wrong but it's quite commendable never put a mask on ever it's, it's criminal i'm not endangering anybody by not wearing a mask but they are trying to endanger me i support that's such a backward logic isn't it i'm not endangering anybody but they're endangering me it's equivalent to saying i don't wear protection because i don't want to but they're endangering me by forcing me to wear protection, right? Isn't that the same sort of thing? You're right to wear the mask because if if your if your mask works, then it shouldn't matter if I have it. Actually, the CDC says it's the other way around. Exactly. They recommend the mask as a courtesy to protect others, not yourself. I don't need to wear a mask. I cannot wear a mask. I pass out. And if my mask doesn't work because you're wearing your mask. It's funny how um, weak, um, you know. <sighs> then I'll take mine off and I'll give it to you. Since the last rally, they say they've been encouraged by a referendum in Provo that seeks to overturn the city's mandate and a lawsuit that challenges the governor's mandate in schools. I really think they are good people who are misguided. Lawsuits are one way to have your voice be heard. I don't think anybody's after money, right? And I think that it's got a huge chance. 
because the Utah Constitution is even more powerful than the U.S. Constitution in a lot of ways. Imagine filing a lawsuit against a governor for mandating statewide mask wearing in schools. It's not like he's gonna, he or she is gonna and said, hey, everyone needs to put one on, you know, in every public setting that you might be in. Just schools, just schools alone. Places where, you know, your, your child or somebody in your family, someone you care about is going and attending, right? Squashed up against each other. And again, maybe this is because they don't believe, in, they believe the science that says, oh, kids don't, you know, kids are, for the most part, if you, what you read, if you believe what you read out there, kids are less susceptible to coronavirus than adults are right um they tend not to pass it on as frequently as well as adults too so that danger is basically wiped out for all intents and purposes but god damn it man what a weird way to spend your energy or to expand to spend your energy imagine that of all things to be doing um <laughs> but hey what do i know another one quivy this is really good this is a, a really good um sort of how do you say this is this is a really good exp representation of what happens online with these debates when it comes to COVID just in general right um just when you think that there's there's going to be there's going to be a moment where both sides can come and come to the table and agree to just disagree or agree in parts and you know spec out some ways to move forward uh, to advance society in some way shape or form to have some sort of collective responsibility looking out for their neighbor blah 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 just when you think it's going to reach that point it just goes left right and this is a good example of it right like uh, <laughs> it's a, it's basically an anti-mask protest and a mask wearing guy basically gets a, into a bit of a tiff with a lady that isn't for the mask and then a random guy gets some stray bullets and it just goes completely tits up from there on let's play this now du, 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 du. come on son <clears throat> Is it going to play? Is it going to play? Maybe not. No, not having it. Not having it. Either. Hold on. Bear with me a second. Let me see if it's still not having it. I don't think it is. Let's minimize this one. Ugh. I probably need to increase the RAM on this computer in order to make it actually work properly. Sometimes I have these technical difficulties that are annoying. Okay, let's re let's reload this again. Come on, work, 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 work. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's loading again. Bear with me one moment. If not, we have to move on to the next one. But I really want to hear this and watch this video. I think this is really funny. Let's see. anti mark protests are roasted and destroyed. Let's see if I can find it to load. Can you load, please, if you don't mind? Okay, it's not loading. Let's go. Let's go to the post on Reddit actually and see if we can get up on there. But yeah, I thought this was hilarious. Easily one of my more interesting and funnier videos I've watched to this week. Easy. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It's loading. Still not loading. Okay, it should be loading now. Come on, son. It's not having it today, is it? It really is not having it today. Come on, man. Okay, maybe we move on then. We'll come back to it in a bit. It's not having it, is it? No, it's not having it. Oh, I'll, I'll try and get it to load up again at the end of the show so I can really show you. But let's move on to another story. Beep, 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 beep. Okay, um. What was I going to say? What was I going to say? Okay, cool. Yeah, this is the bit. This is the one. Let's move into this one. So, um, next part of the story, I want to move on to, of course, as you know, there's been um, a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of a change in the UK when it comes to Corona in terms of how to approach the lockdown. Obviously, we've had these sort of regional lockdowns that are now taking a place in parts of Northern England. Um, so, shout out to anybody in Manchester and Bolton and places like that where you're essentially being ravaged by covid but um it got me thinking about uh remember that scale that was going getting thrown around their places um the kind of five point scale people called it the nando's menu or something along those kind of lines right and i've got it up here on the screen right it's, it goes from uh, one being the lowest state of transmission to five being the highest um 
and basically specking out some of the milestones or some of the scenarios that would basically allow us to move down the scale until we got to one right and um part of the reason why this was put out i guess in the beginning was to alleviate fears isn't it i'm assuming right to make people be you know to make people be at ease not be too worried and all that sort of good stuff so there was some good there was some good intention behind it but now looking at how things are sort of panned out it kind of makes me think that a lot of this was spin because they clearly didn't know the best approach of how to deal with things but it also makes me completely worried about how things are going forward because if they had all the information they had in the past and they still thought this was the best approach and they still had this kind of hands-off kid gloves let's give the british public the the license to make the right and sensible decision dominic cummings going for a drive to test his eyesight all that nonsense right if they thought that was a good way to go about things at that time and now we're at now we're where we are now with the numbers where they are right and you know economies ravaged and businesses you know completely flatlined and stuff what makes us think that it's gonna get any better <laughs> and again not to be dark about this or macabre but what gives anybody any encouragement they're going to get this right because this graph at the time is what i was sucked into it made complete sense but then when it started to play out and we started to move through numbers but then you looked outside and you're like hold on it doesn't make any sense why we're moving through numbers and the numbers are where we're moving through st stages or steps or phases right in our recovery plan or in on the plan of normality when we're still you know when it's still on fire out there it doesn't make any sense i never really understood that um so you got here number five the highest um point of infection is infection is spreading at a dangerous rate the r number is above one the nhs is overwhelmed and hospitals are full the response back into full lockdown 19 girl hospitals reopened of course that didn't essentially happen i think that 19 year old place wasn't full for the most part i think they what's that do you remember they built that kind of overflow place in excel center i don't think they used that that much either so we didn't really get we didn't really stay in that place too long then it was four viruses contained our numbers above one in some regions but the hospitals are not overwhelmed response back into lockdown which we were at the moment and then three was virus contained our numbers below one and partial lift, um, lifting of lockdown some would argue we never actually left four or three even though our numbers would say we should have been in five so and then we reopened parts of the economy whether it's restaurants and bars and we allowed them to have people sitting indoors which didn't make any sense to me prior to people going to gyms which is the funny thing right we allowed bars and restaurants to reopen um before the gyms had before the gyms did just imagine that before gyms are reopened bars and restaurants were reopened which makes absolutely no sense if anything you would think they're probably on the same threat level really i would imagine they would be so in it right um and that never really changed and now we're in a position where they want us to go back to work they want us to go back into the office they want us to go back out and shop they encourage people to go on holiday or oh, they were actually they encourage people to go out and eat you know the eat out help out scheme but we're still in this shit position. And again, just a reminder, where has this graph gone? Who's talking about this anymore? It's completely gone out of the new cycle. You don't, you won't, I wonder if there's going to be a report that will have the guts to bring this up and say, hey, minister, like, what about this five-step plan that you had, this Nando's menu step thing? What happened to that? Is that still on? Absolute donuts. But hey, what do I know? Um, moving on. We got this funny video or not fun sad video actually because it kind of got me thinking about what it must be like for university students at the moment who are currently um having to live in a post or currently having to live in a post-covid world or in a covid world actually it's not probably not post-covid at all and what that must be like i think that's probably one of the more um one of the positions that i don't envy at all right being a parent i guess to young children trying to kind of explain to them what's going on and trying to rationalize or, or, or trying to um, explain why they can't go see their friends why they can't hang out at school why they can't go to tennis football whatever practice right that's it's a very very difficult i'd imagine but also just just think about what it must be like for the kids that are in like year 11 or just finishing sixth form or just about to leave college how they must feel you know heading into university you know you've got all your hopes and dreams ahead of you freshers is a big deal in the uk um you know that 
period just before you start your lessons and you go out and you party you get completely smashed you um discover all the local delights of the place that you're staying at you get to meet all your friends or build you know start to build some new friendships with people that you don't know and just get yourself fully acclimatized to your new surroundings and take the first steps into adulthood but imagine what that must be like now going forward in a post-covid world so i guess the bbc put together a little video describing some of these um uh scenarios with the people that are actually going to university and it's called being freshers during coronavirus i'm going to play a few now <clears throat> this morning i was very very sick Oh, I'm going to uni. I'm two hours away from home. Oh, I've oh, bless this kid, for probably man. like three months or something. <sighs> now I feel amazing. Like it's sort of sense of euphoria right now because I'm actually here. Especially having been at home for that long, right? Imagine, right? You just want to get out anywhere, should, anywhere, shape, possible. It's it's funny because I guess more most people when you leave to go to uni, you're actually looking forward to you know getting fucked and meeting new people. But I guess in this stage or in now, people, kids are probably desperate just to leave in general and just have a change in the scenario. They're desperate to get into education in any way, shape or form, right? Just to kind of get out of the daily dredge that is COVID. Wow, the new students adhere to COVID it's guidelines. It's very quiet here, even though I've got thousands of people around, you still get that feeling of loneliness. You have to fit with the guidelines. If you expose yourself to too many people, you're probably going to end up breaking some rules. Only one person allowed in the lift at all times because of COVID-19. It's oh, how boring is that, man? One person in a lift, how, dis how miserable does that look? It's human nature to want to go up to someone and hug them. Of course. And that's just not possible right now. As you can see, there is literally nobody insight wow if you sit in your room you're missing out on your social life exactly and i'd imagine most of the part of the fun i'd imagine what that scene must look like normally at uni right it just must be littered with bodies and screams and people running around and just you know enjoying themselves now look at it it just looks like the um, it looks like the communal garden of some new build flat somewhere isn't it literally nobody in sight if you sit in your room you're missing out on your social life but you know if you go out there's a chance you could get in trouble or obviously catch the virus i'm not living on campus which means it's harder for me to make friends yeah um as we're not really allowed on the university unless we have anything going on Damn. the students unions open with so, so strict social distancing measures even soon union we'll just get big night um, it's going to be a welcome party. Obviously, it's going to be a lot different. Everybody's going to be socially distanced. The capacity is dramatically limited, but. Student Union raves are like one of the best experiences you could go through. And look at what it's turned into, man. Some, you know, downscaled version of a Pontins holiday. Like, you God damn it. Check, check, check. People aren't going to be jumping up and down. Uh, kind of on the stage, they're going to be seated, which you know. The German radio DJs, eh? Is what it is, but we've got to deal with it. Ugh, the, sh the event is going to be streamed online. <laughs> oh my god, that is so fucking miserable. Imagine your first <laughs> your first party experience at uni, and you're watching it via live stream on your crappy Chromebook in your bedroom somewhere, spilling you know cheap vodka all over the carpet where you sleep. It's just like God. Damn. It'd be a bit weird having people see us in vision, not just kind of audio-wise, because we're kind of used to that. We've, kind of got, we've got kind of faces for radio. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, tell me about that. It's very different to uh, what you might have been expecting when you think of the universe. Uh, it's alright. I mean, every, everyone's in the same place, everyone's in the same situation, so it's just yeah. really good. It's different. Trying to have a good time and meet new people that you kind of always have to think about it. I feel like we're missing out a little bit, yeah, but it's just fun to see a few of the coronavirus, we'll have to do it. So. The space is limited, many students weren't able to attend. 
I'm probably going to start some drawing now, um, which obviously I love drawing, but not Freshers' Week. Jesus so it's really Christ. Quiet. Everyone's either asleep or watching TV. It's 10.30 and I'm just heading into the bathroom to do my nightly routine and then I'm going to go to sleep, which is absolutely insane. I should be on an all-nighter. Just, just, just imagine the irreparable damage that's going to be done to these young people who are having to start university this way. Just imagine. And how soon are they going to be able to kind of um, get back to normal? And, you know, hug their friends, hang out with randoms and just essentially have the quintessential university experience. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And again, I think for their sake, universities kind of have to open. They have to offer this solution in some way, shape or form, because you can't justify paying 30, I don't know, 10 to 30 grand a year to for some live, for some Zoomed um, seminars. Well, yeah, for some, are they called seminars? What are they called, right? lessons via via zoom you can't actually you can't justify that no one's going to be able to justify it doesn't matter what university you go to there's no way that they can justify paying what you have to pay for a yearly because again no university is giving discounts they're not allowing you to you know uh, defer your payments everyone's sort of like you know wanting to get paid now pay me now or you know you don't get your education so the only way to make it worthwhile is to open up these campuses and say hey come in sit you know two meters away from each other don't hug don't touch one person lift only freshers you know celebrate freshers via your laptop because that's the only way we're going to be able to justify paying you this exorbitant pricing and then i guess you know they'll try and sell it like you know hey we got amenities right we provide you with hand sanitizer and all this sort of stuff and really you think hold on your university mate you have hundreds if not thousands of spotty teenagers running around you know scratching their ass sticking fing their fingers in places where they shouldn't be you should have all these sanitary solutions anyway so that isn't even a plus but god damn it man god damn it i, I really do um have a lot of sympathy for those kids that are trying to attend university during these tough times when it must be very very difficult moving on up um or moving on down actually we've got this distressing and kind of uh, so sobering story from john lewis to say they scrapped the bonuses for the first time since 1953 which is mad isn't it really and another indication of just how f-u-c-k-e-d things are at the moment so it says the, the following john lewis confirmed that his staff will not receive a bonus for the first time since 953 after it was hit by lockdown store closures the retailer which also owns waitrose posted a huge 603 635 million pre-tax loss for the six months to july the 25th after higher cost offset a one percent rise in sales its chairwoman told staff on thursday the announcement will come as a blow of course um even before covid hit the chain had warned they might not be able to pay um, the usual staff a bonus as competition ate into profits the group uh, first half loss was 633 million once exceptional items were taken into account including the 400 million write, write down in the value of its stores it's good in these um, one of course the group's loss in those six months stood at 55 million like this is what sometimes i wonder a lot especially with people who are out there protesting and not trying to secure their future because i don't know some of these people might just have trust funds and they're okay but things have changed irreparably sometimes for the worse sometimes for the better but the quicker you're able to kind of um accept the situation and maneuver and make some changes in your life the better it is for you but there needs to be an indicate there needs to be an acknowledgement of what's going on in the world. And if you're seeing places like Pret a Manger struggling, John Lewis struggling, Argos, all these different establishments that we've kind of known and loved, especially in the UK, and you aren't seeing the wood for the trees, you're not kind of seeing that, hey, things are maybe messed up, I need to make some changes in my life, then I don't know what you're waiting for. Because if these companies aren't able to do it, but again, they haven't they this is the first time they're not paying a bonus since nineteen fifty three. And imagine the amount of economical society societal issues or stuff that we may not as prolonged and not as kind of far reaching as COVID but imagine the things that we've gone through as a nation between 953 to 2020 that we're in now and this is the first time they're stopping the bonuses that's a big deal it continues it says the last time the chain which operates as partnership tied not to pay the bonuses of staff was in the aftermath of world war ii that is mad 
chairwoman um dame sharon white said we came through then to be even stronger and we'll do so again she said i know this will come as a blow to partners who have worked so hard this year the decision is no way distracts from the commitment and dedication that he has worn the interesting thing would be to find out if whether or not um whether or not some of the executives took a pay cut in order to kind of offset some of the losses or to ensure that the staff members got paid. I'm sure they did because, you know, for more intense purposes, you always read about John Lewis being a pretty good employer. People always have good things to say about John Lewis and Waitrose and places like that, but I wonder. Um, she said the payment of bonuses will only resume once annual profits rise above 150 million and debt falls. She said the retailer says store closures during lockdown and customers buying less profitable items such as toilet paper or laptops <gasps> had hit the trade show what that's less profitable okay i didn't know that um um is this uh, i guess because they're one-time purchases right maybe is that a thing i don't think so no to what type of present but anyway continues it says um it says made that in his first half john lewis shops saw a 200 million um pound drop in sales why the wider group saw additional coronavirus related costs total about 50 million but in a statement it said that the waitress supermarket had been a re seen a return to the weekly shop um for like like sales up to 10 percent year on year so that's a that's again that's a weird thing because i guess in some respects you would think right especially with people being at home that there is some that there is some there are some people who probably have the means especially if you are able to work from home right or you've been furloughed with pay or something right some people have that have the means to just you know kind of ride this out until they've effectively been let go so they have a lot of disposable income because they're not going to work all the time you're not buying your pret-a-manger's you're just saving a lot of money because you're indoors and you're not going to places where you have to spend money so it would make sense that you might have a little bit more extra money than the month to spend on something to you know to give yourself a bit of retail therapy so you'd think that'll be happening a lot more often but i guess the overall climate of things and just the vibe it's just not there to buy as much as it was prior and i guess part of the reason you shop in some respects is to kind of show off i guess to kind of showcase your haul to you know i don't know brag to your friends get recommendations whatever it may be so i'd imagine you wouldn't be too comfortable doing that right um you know incons inconspicuous um displays of wealth probably aren't the name of the game now i would assume so but i didn't i don't know but interesting to see in it that they've scrapped the bonuses from now moving on do, 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 do. what else do we have here to talk about oh yeah kanye is spazzing out on twitter regarding record labels this has been a fairly interesting state of affairs isn't it so i guess what would you say uh when was this do, 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 do. I guess it all started with this tweet about Vivendi, yeah, Vivendi, Vivendi, the holding company of Universal Music Group. Um, I think their headquarters are in France or something. You hear them mentioned a couple of times during there. It might have been through Kanye actually, and I guess he woke up one day and suddenly thought, you know what? I'm not actually getting the, I'm not getting the splits that I deserve for the music that I put out there. And I, I actually don't have the tweet here at the moment. I think I do have it at the moment. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, yeah, that's actually here. So I guess it all started off with this tweet here, where he basically outs Vivindi, which is this one on screen. And this basically set the whole thing in motion. And now we have this um, constant barrage from him online where he's essentially um, calling out record labels, saying that artists need better splits. And this might come in, this might be a consequence of, you know, artists not being able to tour and not being able to sell merch in a way they did prior. And those being the main sources of revenue um, for some of these artists, especially when you consider how crappy some of these digital streaming platforms pay some of their artists right the splits aren't that aren't the best um it was inevitable that some of the bigger artists who probably feel as if that they should be in a position where they can be you know eating pretty well off some of their best work um when you're suddenly seeing those royalty checks come in and they're not really equaling some of the streaming numbers you're getting online it's going to make you ask some questions and it's interesting because i think there's been an acceptance it feels like i don't know why it is but i guess music industry is one of the last place where it has been it's kind of been in unaffected i guess by yeah it's remained it's kind of remained stuck in time when it comes to reacting or being disrupted by tech and no one seems to have been able to penetrate the music industry people have made you know 
uh, services, platforms that kind of service a need or are able to kind of allow people to get their stuff on on streaming sites or allow people to get in contact with labels or producers. There, there are services out there, but for the most part, the mechanics of the industry are exactly the same as they were in the past, right? Most of the power, most of the control is held in the record label's hands and the artist has basically just agreed to whatever terms they get from the record label because they're so desperate to get their music out there to make the next step in their career that they're willing to sacrifice their long-term uh, splits, their long-term rights, their long-term ownership for the immediate gain of having a good, you know, a, a sizable chunk of money given to you as an advance or to have the benefit of somebody always looking after your entire creative process. Because, you know, not all artists are great business people, not all great business people are great artists, you know, the common argument. But now we're in a stage, it feels like in, in music, where a lot of the kids coming up now are a lot more business savvy by nature, not even just by something they've probably learned just from the state of the market at the moment, right? The moment you decide to be a rapper, the moment you decide to be a DJ, wherever it may be, you immediately have to turn into your own publicist, your own marketeer, your own brand manager, your own videographer. You just have to immediately start getting to grips with these things and you have a, a little bit more of a a little bit more of a fundamental understanding of what goes into each thing. So when suddenly you decide to get signed, you know, a song that you make blows up and you get signed to a label, it's going to be very difficult for a kid that blew up on SoundCloud on his own, making beats on his crappy laptop to be okay with giving away 80% of the rights of his music or his catalog or to sign a 360 deal where the label takes a chunk of everything that you do um, under the moniker of you being an artist or you sign a ridiculous, you know, 10 album deal that spans across, you know, that rolls on year and year without you even noticing after you cleared a certain amount of sales. It's very difficult to get those kids to do that. And again, with all these other big artists like Russ and some of a few other people who have come out speaking about independence, Waka Flugger and these good examples, it's just, it's not as easy as it was in the past to hoodwink people don't get me wrong people are still getting hoodwinked but for the most part it's very difficult to do so as there was prior so it would take somebody like a Kanye to kind of speak up about the issue to for there to be some change and it's good to see that happening I think it was it's in it's kind of uh it was greatly needed and I think oddly enough because of COVID and because the earning potential of artists is completely flatlined for the most part I guess unless you're I don't know and it's just some of the bigger ones and even them they're still not getting favorable splits it's probably advantageous for you to rally behind Kanye in this um really messy situation because that's the only way you're going to get any kind of um solution in terms of what you're going through but the interesting part of it also is that um it also raises some interesting questions around Kanye's own business etiquette right and his the way he's kind of approached his business and maybe it's a consequence of just you know hurt people hurt people but in general if you're familiar with how Kanye does things he's not probably in the best position to basically call out people about signing people in janky deals or not paying certain people um especially if you're if you're familiar with how he records music the fact that he you know um hires or yeah he basically hires a whole bunch of people to come in and work with him to um put together an album to craft together a sound to use as a soundboard wherever you may be right and i guess some things maybe get lost in interpretation things get you know messages don't get crossed here or there but there's been a number of stories about Kanye West not doing business the right way himself with the people that he's dealt with so for him to be positioned now where he's having to call out these labels is very interesting because I'm sure a lot of these artists that haven't been paid from Kanye are looking at him thinking hold on you do some janky business yourself my friend um but again you know I guess the the bigger fight is what Kanye is basically getting at, right? Attacking these big record labels and making them um, do business in a more fair and ethical way. But it's interesting to see somebody like a hit boy, for instance, come out and say the following. The academics, he says, hit boy says the following, he says, I haven't been a fan of Kanye on a personal or human level since he told me face to face he stopped picking my beats because I worked with Beyonce. This is after I produced Niggas in Paris, Click, and a myriad of other songs such projects for him and his label, Good Music, in the two years I was signed to him. In madness, right? And again, this just goes to prove how difficult it is to be Kanye's friend and also get behind him in general, right? Because he does say some amazing things and he comes out 
and you know makes that Harriet Tubman question says slavery isn't a choice it's rages on about Bill Cosby and R. Kelly and this is another instance right where he's got a, he's got a point record labels need to the record industry needs to change artists are enslaved by labels right um the splits are not fair blah 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 but come on you can't be stopping hit boy's career and this is hit boy what in 2000 how long ago was that that might have been 2015 or 30 i don't know what that was right that was a few years ago that was hit boy um grafting in the industry that was hit boy when he was still trying to rap right he was still figuring out what his role was in the industry in the scene still getting to grips with how to maneuver in the industry finding his voice as an artist finding his sound as a producer right he's still trying to figure stuff out to so to for, for someone like Kanye in his position to purposely block him because he felt like he went behind his back to work with Beyonce because I guess at that time Kanye and Jay-Z were going through something is ridiculous petty and so um uh just bad practice in general to the nth degree it just doesn't make any sense in it um but hey i guess hip boys moved on from it and of course he's become what he's become now at the moment so i'm sure he's not stressing but still it does go to prove you know kanye can be a great dude to kind of rally behind with these causes but in terms of dealing with him on a personal level he does seem to be a bit of a cunt in it <laughs> it continues here. it says um this tweet is something I can agree with though. He says, Universal Music Group has held me in what the last three lawyers have hired have referred to as the worst publishing contract they've ever seen. He says, since I was 19 years old, I'm 33 now and I have multiple Grammys, produced a lot of your favorite artists, biggest songs on top of, tour, of turning in over 450 records since I signed and Universal Music Group still doesn't have it in them to simply be fair. Um, they're doing this to me with all that I've accomplished through hard work and I can only imagine what the kids don't have a big plate means of proper guidance if I have to be the one to get blackboard for telling the truth um, and trying to get the next generation free then so be it by the way I produced 10 plus joints on the current number one album in the country Detroit 2 he says he tags the Universal Music Group and says the company who's helping me in the management side Rock Nation let's fix this slave deals are still very real rampant in 2020 again absolute madness i i think it's good to blast this out in public and get this out there kanye in that respect but just the effect you know the fact that he's the one that's doing it's funny considering the amount of janky deals he signed people to here's another example where some guy called adam killer said he kanye tried to sign him to a 35k publishing included i agreed with that what so no you tried to sign me to a 35k with my publishing included i agreed with what you were saying but how many artists are you enslaving to right another one but the comment here underneath is hilarious right because i don't know if that's true it says i'm listening to your music now and you should have gratefully you should have been grateful for the deal he offered you and taking it your music just isn't as good as if i'm being honest bloody hell right and then another person here says the following again says i have four friends this man's refused to pay one of them last year while he was trapped in the chicago studio asked if i wanted him to pass my name along and i cackled and said yeah don't pay niggas <laughs> a year later he still hasn't seen a dime that is mad isn't it another one he says um, i haven't liked an album since Jesus. another album where he refused to pay a friend despite been producing the hit shit the hit um tell me what is the point if we're aligning with this self-hating and dangerous person it's just it's difficult isn't it uh, safe hurting and uh, uh, it, again I, I think unfortunately if you want change you're gonna have to get behind Kanye right he's that much of a force he's that much of an influence he's got that much cultural relevance he moves the needle in that much of a way that unfortunately if you really want to get good splits Kanye is your man you have to go behind him but there obviously is this understanding that he's not the best person to get in business with probably the reason you know uh there's a myriad of reasons maybe the overabundance of too many cooks in the kitchen and all this sort of stuff and costs going sky high because there's always been that question in it around like how does he actually pay a lot maybe some of it starts coming out of his own pocket but especially when you used to do some of these bigger activations prior to Yeezus, prior to prior to Yeezy being what it is now right Madison Square Garden all this sort of big you know uh bombastic stuff like who's actually paying for this right who's writing this off like who decides that's a good idea to market an album right to how will these random models stand and pose on this amazing you know uh, performance art piece in the middle of my square garden like garden who thinks that's a good idea what record label would kind of sign off on that and then you see him not paying certain people you know for their work on albums and you're thinking to yourself like who, 
who's signing that off? who's signing those deals off who's cutting those checks because it definitely isn't the person that's meant to be paying people and it continues here. it says mind you this kid was in the PSG program and bouncing around mills or bouncing around motel story yes team knew this and took full advantage of this because they knew he'd never publicly called them out which is happens quite often more often than not if you know which is funny because the moment you kick up a fuss the moment you sort of like threaten to go public or you do go public it's a moment these brands or these big conglomerates these big entities decide to suddenly invoice you or pay the invoice or cut the check it's really annoying that this tends to happen um continue to says many of your fave black artists and creatives don't actually pay black people or give them the respectable rate but will yell from the mountaintops about why they should be paid fairly but that's another conversation for a later date lol which is some accurate point and then somebody here says this very accurate point here about Hudson Mohawk you remember he went through a very public um feud with Drake and Kanye I think at the time and then kind of recounted I think once he got paid so there is a there is a bit a bit of a common theme with Kanye being a bit of a janky business person business uh person in his own right but again like I said I think unfortunately if you do want some change if you do want the industry record industry to, to um become more fair you are going to have to band around kanye he's going to have to be your guy unfortunately uh, but again let me know what you think of the what your thoughts and comments down below do you think kanye is a bad businessman do you think he's just doing business the right way are people overreacting will the record industry actually notice their faults and um spec out some better terms for artists or will they just say f you pay me and keep it moving let me know in the comments down below okay Next here, let's move on. What should I talk about? Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, let's talk about this. This is a funny. Oh, funny. Yeah, this this is hilarious. Actually, very very hilarious. Considering everything that's going on, so a story um was published via well via motherboard on Vice. Um, and the title is the following. It says, Spotify CEO defends um, keeping transphobic Joe Rogan on podcasts online. Multiple sources inside Spotify describe an all-hands meeting in which Spotify CEO Daniel Ek discussed the company's handling of the controversial podcast, which is funny because this comes off the back of Daniel, the same dude, Ek, um, having to come out and essentially defend a position of Spotify in terms of how they split and you know how they split their revenue with artists and the fact that he was basically saying that he basically accused artists of being lazy or a segment of the artists that complain um for not putting out a lot of music for not adjusting to the times and you know catering to the platform a lot of debate around it right it was kind of brewing and you know that got under people's bonnet you know and you know it is what it is but this debate was more interesting because you could have seen this coming a mile off right considering that um you know spotify is a scandinavian based company or was founded by a, a guy from scandinavia considering their politics um considering the politics of most startups it did seem quite interesting that they'd go after joe rogan right they'd kind of want him to um boost uh boost their podcasting platform um to kind of bring them into a new dawn to make you know acquire some more users it was an interesting approach because you would have known that one way or the other just even through joe rogan's guest or just through some of the things he says himself there was definitely going to be an issue there's definitely going to be a butting of ideology there's definitely going to be a butting of worldviews that you just can't kind of get around there's no changing the minds of the people who think joe rogan's a transphobe and there's no change in the mind of someone like a joe rogan to take people seriously who dye their hair pink and complain about the pronouns people refer to them as right it's just not going to happen right they ideologically ideologically come from two different places they're always going to butt heads and it's interesting as a position to be in as a ceo because this is these are decisions that definitely define your company for the long run and sometimes you have to um upset your own team in order to kind of get to the next stage you're getting to it's kind of one of those unfortunate positions that most ceos come into right you read most accounts you read most stories everyone kind of has this moment as a ceo as a leader of a big company where they make a decision that isn't very popular with their own employees but allows them to you know grow into a new sector um evolve into a new market completely change their approach whatever it may be dominate as comp a sector there is this inflection point this sort of like um fork of the road that you need to decide to go along and unfortunately it's going to upset some of the employees that were fundamental to you actually building your company and getting to a place that you are now at the moment and joe rogan's one of them 
and they've paid him so much money if you believe the figures 100 million up front with you know more at, at the back end if he hits some milestone which is obviously going to do and they've invested heavily in this idea that if they license this guy's podcast on their platform it's going to attract the eyes it's going to make them a serious player in the game blah 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 blah, blah. there's obviously some um, potential for them to do some other stuff with joe in the future if things get you know if they develop into more of a tech company um it, you could see this growing and growing and growing so it's interesting to see what the approach will be from daniel Ek. how does he maneuver around this because this is a very very pivotal moment for spotify and how they go forward let's continue with the article Said Spotify in all hands company meeting on Wednesday. Spotify's CEO Daniel Ek defended keeping transphobic content from hugely popular podcaster Joe Rogan on the audio platform. Um, some staff inside the company feel alienated by Spotify's hosting of a certain Joe Rogan experience episodes. According to copies of some of the questions presented to the meeting obtained by Motherboard, the new signals um, how Spotify as it moves into the podcasting space beyond music is facing content moderation decisions more commonly associated with social platforms like facebook and twitter which is so difficult to judge you know you start moving the goalpost you start banning people um you then are held to a certain standard other things change it's just not an enviable position to be in whatsoever spotify has already removed jerry episodes from right wing fee figures including alex jones and gavin mcginnis now that's the more interesting part of it right and this maybe confirms what a lot of people have um speculate online because when joe rogan made the switch to spotify a lot of episodes supposedly went missing during the pour over which a lot of people didn't agree with didn't really believe right if, if you if you've ever kind of had to import your rss feed onto another platform or to get it submitted you'll know that things take a while to kind of you know uh, populate on the new feed or on a new platform but they do populate in chronological order for the most part and you know give it a day or two and your most of your library even if you've got 1000 plus episodes will Will appear in its entirety on that platform the fact that the ones that are missing were from the more controversial characters with the exception of a few of one or two here and there goes to show that for sure spotify came in editorially content wise and decided to remove some of the episodes owen benjamin's alex jones gavin mcginnis the money Apples, because you know they essentially have banned them for their platform anyway so it makes complete sense but i didn't Oh, that I didn't like, but I find it interesting that Joe Rogan number one didn't uh, didn't didn't address it, which is odd considering he's, you know, he rallies against identity politics, he rallies against gender issues, he rallies against censorship. It's one of his kind of main tropes that he kind of goes back to again and again. He's always kind of ranting about censorship, right? He essentially had Twitter on uh, with Tim Paul and one of their lawyers basically talking about censorship, right? And dead naming and banning people on the platform. And, you know, they went through a complete whole back and forth. That was one of his main go-tos. So for him not to address it at all is concerning. The fact that he kind of leaked the news to Alex Jones at all, we were porting the shows over and we're actually going to have a Joe Rogan best of hits and leave it on the YouTube was bullshit. We all knew that was crap, right? We all knew he was lying, which is not, you know, it's not a bad thing, I guess. You know, if you're getting paid a hundred million dollars right for your podcast by spotify and the other hundred million is dependent on you hitting some milestones and also being agreeable and also maybe you know allowing some maneuver in terms of what is allowed in the content then it is what it is it's not selling out i think he's been in the game long enough for that but it would have been good to approach it in some way shape or form and tell the audience but again maybe it feels like it doesn't owe anybody an explanation but this is definitely proof or evidence of some some kind of evidence towards that points more in the direction of spotify deciding to remove the episodes as opposed to joe rogan saying hey i'm going to put them on youtube instead i don't think that was a fact so it continues it says in the joe in in the case of joe rogan a total of 10 meetings have been held with various groups and individuals to hear the respective uh, concerns exit according to free sources and some of them one Rogan removed because of what he said in the past. Oh, look, I even put a snitch hotline there in the middle. He says, free sources provided Mobileboard with some of the questions submitted to the town hall meeting. Mobileboard granted them anonymity as they weren't authorized to speak on the press about internal Spotify issues. So two of those questions submitted in the Q&A section of the meeting highlight some of the Spotify's employees' concerns about Joe Rogan's content. Just and again, just imagine the amount of money that's on the line the amount of money that's on the line, not only just what they paid him, but potential earnings, um, you know, the legality of it, like this is a decision they, they cannot take lightly. I'm sure they cannot take this lightly. But again, most likely they're not, they're going to have to side on the, they're going to have to side with Joe Rogan if they want to really 
take things to the next level because the moment they back on under the pressure of their own staff members because of this ideological issue is probably going to be mark the end of spotify for sure for, for for you know you can probably put a bet on that one so here's the question says, um one of the submitted question was many lgbtqa plus um ally and spotifyers feel unwelcome and alienated because of leadership response to jerry conversations what is your message to these employees <laughs> jesus this is a hot one another one said why has spotify chosen to ignore spectrum erg's guidance about the transphobic content in jerry's catalog uh, referring to the group of spotify workers who focus on related issues at the meeting Eck also told employees not to leak to the media noting if you if we can't be open and confidential debates we will have to move these discussions to a close those doors which is a very sneaky way to approach this right he must have known signing joe rogan was going to be an issue with his staff members who are probably liberal left-leaning people he must know it's going to be an issue there must have been conversations prior to this so to suddenly now gag your employees from talking about this publicly in any way shape or form again maybe not you know with their name attached to it but in any sort of anonymous sources really anonymous fashion sorry is really fucked up um i think so i think they're within their rights to voice their concerns about it um of course if if it comes to a point where they identify the leaks and you get fired you can't then complain it is what it is they set the rules but if they're willing to kind of come out with you know without putting a name to it but you know at least accurately represent their side of the argument is fine but again i think this is where you get paid this is where you actually earn your coin as a ceo what do you do in this position if that was me and i decided to go with joe rogan and use that to kind of push my new service into to a new um dawn then of course i stick with the guy because i've invested 100 million into him right i have no other option and i have to but you have to be in a position where you can of course listen to the concerns of your employees acknowledge their voice but then also be very clear in that you are the leader you are the person that's ultimately um hired to make these tough decisions right you're not there to um lead some of the uh, what you call it some of the all hands on a friday right you're there to basically guide oversee and make some of the top tough calls that are essentially going to ensure that spotify stays around for the next five to ten years because there's no guarantee of that either right tiktok comes around and decides to start a streaming service right you the there's no telling how quickly that could grow and become the dominant leader so you can't take a position for granted you have to kind of always be on the offensive and this is one of the offensive moves they decide to do they decide to kind of you know cut the nose to spite their face and hire some like Joe Rogan even though he's maybe uh what's that? he maybe goes against some of their staff's um outlooks and perspective on life but it is what it is so it continues it says um other concerns specifically over a recent episode X said and Joe Rogan and the episode in question um have been reviewed extensively the fact that we aren't changing our position doesn't mean we aren't listening which i like it just means that we have a different judgment call and i think the actual video in question was this one where no what well, a video but the, the the one of the reasons why some of joe rogan's song gets backlash is i guess caitlin jenner decided to voice her concerns about joe rogan on tmz which definitely um put some added pressure on him and it's funny because he's been going at the kardashians and the jenners for years right he's got he's got them joke on his special he said some very spicy things about caitlin jenner he obviously isn't a fan of of caitlin um in this incarnation at all he was obviously a big fan of Bruce um that he says quite often right that we lost an olympic athlete or something along those lines he said some really really questionable things so it only was a matter of time before it kind of you know the the, the straw finally broke the camel's back and this is caitlin jones response to joe rogan's constant jibes at her and his family at her and her family sorry Continues rogan this is not the first time uh he said things like this um he's a homophobic transphobic ass um and he calls my family especially the girls crazy bitches and he does this all the time part of me thinks a lot of it has to do with the fact that joe rogan he sees a lot of himself in that family he knows it could have eased he could have easily been caitlin jenner in this situation the way he kind of frames it is that oh because caitlin jenner as bruce back then was surrounded by so many crazy females that it was only a matter of time before that crazy somehow infected his brain and then decided that he wanted to transition right that's kind of his way of thinking of the joke through so maybe joe rogan oddly enough sees himself in caitlin jenner and that family and says bloody hell i could have gone down this route too 
and you know hurt people hurt people all that sort of good stuff and maybe that con- that constant ragging on them is about that or just the fact that they're just a funny a bit of a freak show of a family right in 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 the nicest way possible they just are right they've essentially um built an entire career and empire off of exploiting their inner family dynamics for the world to see um they've made themselves gazillionaires right in the process too um they've redefined what fame is right they've essentially they, they might have been the reason why people don't actually recognize talent anymore that much right and back in the day when you to had you actually have an actual talent to be famous or be well known now you're just well known for just being well known the term public figure comes to mind right what does that even mean um so maybe that's the reason why but it's it, i'm actually quite happy to see caitlin finally respond and say something because some of the jabs that she's been getting on joe rogan has been consistent so i don't think joe can be mad at caitlin kind of ragging on him now let's get real here my daughters have obviously done extremely well they're more famous they have more money than he famous, has I'm not sure about they, that one. money they have sure. just about everything more than he has okay He's gotten his fame by putting other people down and not true. Uh, making jokes about it. My family has done it through hard work. I mean, mm, hard work, really. My girls have worked their tail off. They've been smart business women. Um, they are intelligent. They're extraordinarily hardworking, and that's how they've made their their businesses and their fame. They didn't do it by making jokes about other people and putting them down. I think if they could tell jokes, they probably would, but you know. Uh, he says maybe because I was around all these crazy bitches that I, you know, transition. <laughs> it's not even close. I mean, I've had these, I've had been gender dysphoric my entire life. I just tried it to, once I got to the point in life where I, I could, my kids were raised and they're all doing well and this and that. Maybe I could live the remainder of my life uh, authentically. And it has been the most wonderful experience I ever had. I, I wake up in the morning every day and I'm so happy because I can just be myself all day. Would you go on his podcast and what would you say to him about telling those kinds of jokes? Being gender dysphoric, transitioning, all of that is not a joke. It's very serious stuff. You're concerning family. I had the dancing around the question. It's interesting, right? Would you go and you, like imagine after everything this guy said about your family, about you personally, about the car accident, about your transition, questioning your motives, calling you a bad person, a horrible role model, all these really, really bad things. They ask you point blank about whether you go on the show and, and Caitlin starts rambling for 20 seconds plus and in the end says, hey, yeah, I probably would go on the show. It's like, you know, isn't that basic? Isn't that a real, isn't that like a representative of just how weird of a family they are right after all has been said you definitely still will go to show why because it's exposure because it's a platform because it allows you to amplify your voice in some extent it's just ugh. again i am very curious to see how this plays out but let me just uh, i think end the last bit of the actual article here i'm interested to see how this plays out with spotify i really am what will they do will they buck under the pressure or will they stick with their uh cash cow or their way or that they've sort of secured and again this also has some um impact with the joe budden podcast right don't think a lot of the reason why probably joe budden didn't get the money that he wanted or the equity or the splits that he wanted basically you know because they spunked most of their cash on joe so for them to maybe renege on the issue the deal to step away from it due to his controversial statements is going to be interesting to see how this plays out so it says um in this recent in a specific episode of Joe Rogan Experience, Eck was referring to from July in which Rogan interviewed Abigail Schreier, author of the book Irreversible Damage of Transgender Craze, seducing our daughters, according to one of the sources. From the opening moments at podcast, Schreier associates transgender youth with those with autism. Schreier and Rogan uh, spend parts of the episode explaining that young people are beginning to be pressured to transition by YouTube and other media. Again, to be fair to Rogan, if you watch the podcast, you know this is one of his staple topics, right? Um, um, social justice warriors uh hunting mma uh you know wanking and himself silly about stand-up comedy uh ragging on people who don't make furniture and quit their jobs like he's got this, some staples that he kind of goes through and this is just one of them but it's funny that this is such this is so on point in terms of a takedown right even the title of her book is flipping wild and even just the quote that they pulled out from it and again 
pulling out quotes from a podcast is always a bit disingenuous, right? It takes away from some of the, you know, um, context of the conversation. But, you know, hey, what can you do? It says, quote, continues here. It says, you realize that people are not looking at this objectively. Rogan said in the podcast, it said there are activists and they have this agenda. And this agenda is very ideologically driven that anybody who f even thinks that they might be trans should be trans and are trans and the more trans people are better. <sighs> Again, how, what are they going to do, Spotify? In the book, Shire advocates, sorry, invalidates the lived experience of trans people by comparing transitioning to adolescent phen uh, phenomena like eating disorders self-harm or occult according to men's health she also described wanting to transition as a contagion with the potential to affect other children uh, in an entirely scientifically basis idea men's health noted of course you're going to get your your kind of um other statements from men's health in it but yeah that's a wild again taking stuff out of context from a podcast is just it's always going to make you look bad they continue to say that Spotify, we strongly are committed to the LGBTQ plus community and diversity in all its forms. The Spotify spokesman and told Motherboard, all the employees are respected and we believe that everybody has a right to be heard. We have a number of forums for open and transparent discussion and we encourage rigorous debate on topics across the company. All the content on Spotify is subject to our long-standing content guidelines. Our diverse team of experts reviewed the content in question and then determined that it did not meet the criteria to be removed from our platform. Which again is interesting, isn't it? Like how far do you go with this sort of stuff do you have to remove certain artist songs can you have stuff from like popcorn and vibes cartel on there like well how far do you take this like of course the drill stuff's a good example right they did take down some videos from youtube but this is a very um sketchy platform to kind of be on right or stage in, in your business like when you're trying when you're basically um the judge and, judge and jury as to who has a career especially if you become the monopoly and you have an unfair advantage on the market, right? Imagine if Spotify ends up being, you know, um, the biggest digital streaming platform in the world. And there's an artist you have to be on there in order to make it, but then you can't make it on there because you have some spicy content. Your music is, the lyrics of your music are maybe not deemed acceptable for, for that platform. Because again, for ideological purposes, not objectively, just from ideological point of view, that's a very, very um, slippery slope to get on. So again, what do you do if you're the CEO of Spotify? Do you side with your employees who have got a new position in the first place, right? I'm sure there's some, you know, um, OG employees there from when they were working out of a bloody co-working space somewhere in the middle of nowhere town. You're suddenly where you want to be now. You've hanged in there. You've secured one of the biggest podcasters in there. You've got a great team and your team now are complaining that this recent hire, this recent employee, this recent um, ad uh, attachment um, to your company is causing them pain and strife. What do you do? Do you side with that recent ad to your company who is also bringing you in loads of money, right? Because again, they paid him a hundred mil, but don't think, you know, he's not generating a lot of cash for this company too. It's a very interesting place to be in. At the same time, at the same time of writing, Shire episodes on Spotify, the company has made content and moderation decisions to not port several older episodes on the platform. Exactly. However, episodes 911 and 9 and 12 to 55, both of which feature Alex Jones, are not hosted on Spotify, which is again an indication that it was Spotify made a decision editorially and not Joe. I know that story he sold to, to Alex Jones was a lie. In 2018, Spotify removed Alex Jones' own podcast from the platform for hate content. Spotify is also not hosting episodes in which Rogan interviewed far-right personalities Gavin McGuinness and Chuck Johnson. The Spotify catalog does include episodes featuring Stefan Molyneux, who Southern Poverty Law Center amplifies as, as scientific racism and who was banned from YouTube earlier this year. Seth Molly is the guy that measures people's brains and shit in it, so yeah, that's no, that's no like, um, that's no loss, but still, you know, there's still, there's, there's still a point there about moderation, um, about censorship that Joe definitely needs to address. Rogan has um given people all the uh people give people like this access to gigantic audience, and Rogan rarely challenges his guests. Uh, again, this is a really bad article. He does challenge his guests on on a constant basis. To be fair, um, allowing them to launder. Um, their bad ideas on the show. Data Society researcher Beck Lewis has argued that um, Rogan given a platform uh, to these people has led his audience to down a more extremist rabbit holes on YouTube. Lewis describes Rogan as a libertarian influencer with mainstream appeal. This is a 
bizarre takedown of somebody in it again i don't really mind it i think everybody should be given a platform to say exactly what they want um i think it's up to us as a public to decide who we amplify who we listen to um you know going around policing what people can and cannot say on different platforms is absolutely insane once you start doing it for one person you have to do it for others and then where do you draw the line and again if you're a business and you want to attract the biggest audience you want to make money you live in a capitalist world that's what you're about you have to look at the object objectively and just essentially pick the best not best of bad but you have to look at it objectively and pick and figure out a solution that works best for your company in the long term and not only fixate on these ideological battles that might just be an issue for the moment that we're in at the moment but then you know 10 years down the line it's not a situation because prior to this Joe Rogan existed what in you know in the post social justice world Joe Rogan existed uncontested for a long period of time the moment things change particularly and societally he then became a problematic figure which he isn't really objective if you think about it right the fact that he puts you know I look at the Candace Owens interview being a good example of it right Candace Owens talks out of a bloody ass and he gave her a platform and she essentially hung herself on that on that show right she essentially proved that she didn't really have much about her right she was a grifter in her own right um and that was it right so if you were an objectively rational person who went into that conversation with an open mind, willing to kind of, you know, be swayed either way, you probably lift up from that conversation thinking, you know what? This kind of sewing woman doesn't have a Scooby. She doesn't even know what she's talking about, right? She's a complete dunce. And you just step away from it and keep it moving. But you don't say ban her, get her off the platform, take away her PayPal, uh, and not allow her the opportunity to speak on some of the biggest platforms out there in the public square. Um, effectively take away her possibility to make money, to put a roof over her head, just because you don't agree with her political leanings or with her worldview. That isn't the right way to go about things, in my opinion. It continues, it says, in another recent episode, Rogan explained a joke he made in 2016 about Caitlyn Jenner's transition, describing Jenner as he and using her dead and using her dead name Bruce. Rogan also mischaracterized the reason for Jenner's transition, saying that she might be an inf uh, been around a okay, crazy woman thing. He said she's just homophobic. As recently as August 21st, in what he said was the first episode of the podcast of Spotify, Rogan joked that the Democratic Party just want to walk, talk shit and make sure everyone is trans. <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> taking these jokes out of context again is so horrible. So he. he Followed this up by saying, I don't mean that trans people, I'm with you. He said, he also said, my only pushback is about trans people competing in females with, uh, as females in fighting Rogan as a UFC commentator and was referring to his long standing objection to trans women fighting other women in MMA in recent, which is, you know, shouldn't be really be an argument, innit? That, that should just, I, I don't really see why this is a debate. It should just be like a, why can't they just make a division for trans people? That would just kill the debate completely. I think, you know, putting women into an octagon with people that are trans or with people who have gone through some sort of trans procedure isn't safe on both fronts. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and the best way to kind of acknowledge their existence, I think, and in a respectful way would be to just to create another division. Um, you know, objectively putting... Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. That's a mad one even to get, get involved in. It says, in recent days, Donald Trump said he'd be willing to go on JRE to debate Joe Biden on Wednesday. Trump sent an email to supporters in which he asked them to petition demand Joe Biden to come out of his basement to agree to a long uh, debate with President Trump. Joe Reagan announced that he moved to Spotify and made a JRE debut on Spotify September the 1st and will become exclusive available on the platform later this year, according to a statement from Spotify. In his announcement, Rogan said, Spotify want me just to keep doing what I'm doing here. It's just a licensing deal, so Spotify if I won't have any creative control. So again, interesting, man. I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on this. I want to see how this develops. Um, will Joe um, have to change the way he approaches his content which i don't think he'll ever do that's what makes him special or will spotify come in with the editorial hammer and decide what and how he can speak about certain things on his podcast but either way it's gonna be interesting to see how this develops going on let me know what your comments are regarding this issue in the comments down below do you think john rogan is a transphobe do you think kaylin jenner is overreacting do you think spotify will cave and essentially kill the deal and still have to pay him out what do you think will happen in this situation? Anyway, it's now in 30 minutes for the show. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time listening, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and even comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five-star review, download the show, and share it with your friends. And of course, if you want to support the podcast via Patreon, please do. Link is down below. It's patreon.com for just Agostina. That's patreon.com for just A G O S T I N H O. Subscribe on there for as one dollar per month to get access to my entire library as well as this show in full audio format before it's on any other platform. 
um what other updates i've got oh i've got some streaming djing stuff i'm going to be showing you guys soon in the next few days so keep an eye out for that i'll probably do a live stream for the ufc on the weekend just because why not so if you want to hang out for the ufc fight night i don't know which one which one is that actually let me double check that one which one is that give me a moment to double check it it is oh yeah covington woodley actually yeah so finally covington woodley if you're around and you want to um watch that along with the boy grab a beer and whatever it may be then make sure you do probably on the weekend so that'll be what from like sunday maybe 2 a.m uk time so definitely check that out if you're about i'll probably be streaming this live on youtube so if you're around definitely pop on by but until then see you guys very very soon take care peace